Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today we are diving back into what is going on with the story of Ruby Frankie and the Frankie family. For just a little bit of background, Frankie, the mother of six kids, along with her business partner and therapist, apparently, Jody Hildebrandt, were arrested recently on counts of child abuse. And what we're finding out is that a lot of these very controversial, abusive parenting, parenting techniques were from Jody Hildebrandt's method of what she called therapy. And so as a therapist, I wanted to dive in from the perspective of Jessie Hildebrand, who is her niece, who was raised by Jody Hildebrand for a period of time. And so recently, Jessie Hildebrand, the niece, actually spoke out on a Mormon Stories podcast, but then when she found out that Ruby Frankie was accusing one of her own children of sexual assault and molesting other children in the family, then she felt that she needed to speak out to more mainstream media, and so she reached out to the local news station, did this interview that we're going to be reacting to today. So let's dive into it. When was the last time you either saw, spoke to, or in a way heard from Jody? Has it been a long time? It's been a long time. I think it was um, a family member's wedding, like probably over a decade ago. You were also under her care at one point, right? Yeah, I was, I was left in her care when I was a teenager um, for a little under a year. Have you met Ruby before? No, I, um, I've never met Ruby. I don't, I, this is the first time I've ever heard of her. I have gone and watched um, at least some of her videos, they're very difficult to watch just for my own, um, my own experience with that form of therapy or therapy. Um, it's, it's quite triggering to be honest. Um, so I've never met her, um, but the things that she is saying and regurgitating are very, very familiar to me. Um, it's interesting to watch the, I mean, I, and I understand this, but it's interesting to watch the world respond to her and kind of putting her at the forefront. And I understand that she's the mother of these children and it, and it makes sense, but the philosophies and the therapeutic modalities that she's using are and, these are and so let me say really quickly when Jesse Hildebrandt is saying that some of these things that she's seeing are triggering for her I imagine that being raised by Jody Hildebrandt for about a year a little less than a year like she said must have led to some kind of trauma when we have trauma there are sometimes triggers things that remind us of that incident. And this may not even be on a very conscious level. For her, it seems like it may be. And so what it means by something being triggering is that something sets our brain off into fight or flight mode. That can be very problematic or just very unhelpful for people trying to function with trauma in their lives and in their past. Because you can just be going about your day and then suddenly something is triggering for you and then suddenly you feel like you're right back in that moment of danger or where your life was threatened. And that's just not a very productive way to go about life. Not that that's the person's fault, but that's just the nature of trauma. These are not new. These are not, um, this, this is a pattern that Jody has been um, engaged with for at least 14 years. Dang. Um, that's a long I don't time. know if there are other people that she's used these on, but she's definitely taught. I know that she teaches parents to use these types of, um, therapies as she as she would call them and that's really concerning too so i took a quick look at jody hildebrand's website and she is charging hundreds if not thousands of dollars for families to be educated using her parenting methods and as we'll see later she was recommended very highly by the church that she was a part of. And so there is a lot of abuse of the authority that she had based on her license and her education and her backing from the church to be able to teach these very harmful things for parents to mimic. And as Jesse Hildebrand is talking about, mimic very closely for someone who's been through Jody's care to recognize immediately as the same talking points, the same kinds of abuse that she went through herself. Mm. So yeah, it's been a it's been a really interesting experience watching everyone focus on Ruby, and I understand why. But this is Jody. These are Jody's words. These are Jody's ideas. These have are over decades old. So 
Yeah. Is that why you've called Jody the mastermind behind all of this? Yes. Um, that doesn't excuse Ruby's involvement and her pe perpetuating these, these beliefs and these systems. But Ruby didn't come up with this. Um, Ruby um, obviously supports it and um, has used these on her children. Um, but this is coming from Jody. In short, can you just... I think it has to be said too. There's been a lot of discussion about like whose fault it is, whether it's CPS or Ruby's fault or Jody's fault. And you can just look in the comment section of our previous video on this to see how the differences in opinion are. But I think there's a good point that Jesse Hildebrandt makes that as the professional in the situation, as the licensed person in the situation, Jody Hildebrandt needs to be held to a higher standard. And I think this is something that we as therapists and counselors don't think through enough that we are in a position of authority and power. We have been given authority that we have earned through our education and doing the whole internship residency piece. But there is actually room for us to abuse that. And we don't often think of ourselves as powerful people, or at least I don't. But this shows what can happen if somebody abuses the power that's been given to them by a church, by a licensing board, by virtue of their education. Describe what you mean. Like which practices yeah. are you talking about? Just to make sure we're clear, because I know there's a lot out there. So which ones are you talking about that, that you've seen, that you're hearing about pertaining to her children that you're familiar with too? Sure, yeah. Um, so the things that I experienced while living with Jody, I experienced being tied. I experienced being duct taped. I experienced being blindfolded. I experienced uh, severe isolation. I experienced severe emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. I experienced um, the being told I, I, I shouldn't be around other people, being told that I was dangerous to be around. Um, I was, people were afraid of me to the point where I was afraid of myself. This is something that's come up as I did a little bit of reading into Jody Hildebrandt and her form of therapy and her theories on, on the people that she worked with that she would make them afraid of themselves. She was very fear-based and control-based and telling people, I think especially husbands and families, that they were a danger to their wife and their kids and separating the families, separating people from each other. And that's, that's all about control. That's not about reconciliation. For most family therapies, you are looking for people to engage with each other, interact with each other, practice how to communicate with each other, from what Jesse Hildebrandt is sharing. This is not about getting somebody to the point where they can better communicate, better engage. This is about separating people, leaning on fear to control them. I was physically, I was, I was forced to sleep outside in the snow. I was, um, like I said, what? isolated for up to 12 hours a day. Um, if I, if someone wanted, if someone spoke to me directly, if I wasn't wearing duct tape on my mouth, um, I had to just stare at them and not respond because she also had systems of people that would re wow. report back to her if I broke any of these rules. Okay, so it's being forced to sleep in the snow, being isolated for t 12 hours at a time. I mean, these are torture methods. And then also having the system of informants that she's talking about. I mean, I hear cult, I hear torture. I mean, this is not the way to raise kids. And I'm glad that most people in the comment section are realizing that and saying that. It's so hard to believe that it's gotten to this point where she had, like she said, Jody's been doing this for dozens of years. Now, maybe someone's putting a stop to it. So let's see where she goes with this. And her whole thing, which is, deeply, darkly ironic is that everything is stems from shame and how, how horrible shame is hmm. and that all of the reason, like all of mental illness, all um, ticks, so like OCDs, addiction, everything stems from shame, um, which is just horrifying because she is the greatest uh, perpetuator of shame. Um, yeah, for sure. All of these punishments or whatever practices she wants to call them 
These are all methods of reinforcing that feeling of shame, that there's something wrong with you, that you don't belong with your community, whether it's being isolated from your family, not being allowed to talk to people. And so shame does play a big part in mental health, but the way that we deal with shame start being aware of the thoughts that are leading to shame. What is it I'm telling myself? Am I not worthy of respect? Am I telling myself that people are not going to like me because of X, Y, or Z that I feel embarrassed or ashamed about? But the way that I like to go about it is to recognize those thoughts and then through mindfulness to be able to feel what does that shame really feel like for me? To actually move towards that shame and be able to express that understand it and know what it feels like and then to be able to feel that emotion which allows us to move past it without trying to push it away or control it or hide it she also and this is like a, a very deep connection and why i chose to come forward to the media rather than just staying with the podcast um she accused me of being a sex addict she accused me mm. of being uh, addicted to masturbation to the point where I wasn't allowed to, I, I mentioned this on the podcast, to the point where I wasn't allowed to use tampons. Um, hmm. I never was allowed privacy unless I was isolated. So that included the bathroom. I was never allowed to have the door closed oh, wow. because she was convinced that I was just constantly masturbating. She was convinced that I was addicted to porn. Um, I had never seen porn at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. I, I'd never, I didn't even know that people with... <laughs> my anatomy could masturbate like I, I had no idea any mm. of this stuff but i just believed her because she everything like one she used religion and god as a mode of control mm -hmm. um and a, a mode to manipulate and so i just believed all of these things so her ability to convince you of these uh neuroticisms and um these behaviors is and i was a teenager and so a child in that position of being told this over and over and over and over again, which I'm certain he was, um, stood no chance. Yeah, for sure. And this is, again, speaking to the amount of influence that not only adults and parents, but people who are given positions of authority, like a therapist or a counselor. But when we say something, people take that as true that we know what we're talking about. And so that's why it's really important for us to be ethical in our work, to be understanding and to be careful about the kinds of judgments and evaluations that we make. And she's saying this with the benefit of hindsight. Looking back, she can say, well, no, I wasn't addicted to masturbation. I didn't even know what that was. But at the time, because she was told this over and over again, she started to believe these things about herself and she started to fear herself, like she said, to fear her shame. And in, in contrast to the idea of mindfulness, when we fear something, we tend to avoid it. And so we're running away from emotions, running away, hiding away from the feelings that make us uncomfortable. And that's counterproductive to mental health and wellness because of what the, like the abuse and torturing that was going on and the the belief that she had that I was doing something more so her rationale to the severity of these punishments and this physical and emotional abuse was she wanted to make my life and this is like her quote like this is what she would tell me all of the time she wanted to make my life so uncomfortable that it would force the sin out that it would force me to confess so things can Scared straight programs don't work. They're not research backed. And I don't think there's been any studies that definitively prove that you can scare someone or torture someone into long-term changing their behavior. You might get some compliance just because they want to avoid the punishment. And she'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you're looking for actual change that what you're looking for from a counselor or a therapist, we might talk about something like motivational interviewing, which is a very non-directive way of helping someone to clarify what their actual goals are and whether their current actions line up with that goal and using that tension, that discrepancy to really be able to say, well, how can we better direct your actions? What can we do differently to move you towards your goals? But it comes from honest evaluation of our actions in light of the values that we have and our goals not by someone telling us, this is what you need to do. This is what's wrong with you. This is what you need to change. I'm going to push you. I'm going to torture you and I'm going to abuse you until 
you can form. Continuously got worse and worse and progressively more and more intense as a way to get me to confess because she believed that if I had confessed everything, if every all of my sins were out and in the open, that I would be getting better. And I was declining like very fast, exponentially. And um, Gee, I wonder so why. she just kept ramping it up. And so to hear Ruby to tell the world that her child is a sex addict, a predator, and has been addicted to porn since he was three years old, it just echoes exactly mm. the things that she was telling me and telling everyone around me. Um, and I know that I, I've, I've, I think if I got, I don't know if I got this right, but I'm pretty sure that she's saying that he even confessed to it. Well, I also confess to things that I didn't do as a way of trying to get the abuse to stop. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when she's like drilling it into you both psychologically and physically that there's more and it will stop once you tell her, because that's what, that's what she would tell you. Like in the middle of the abuse, she'd be like, I'll stop as soon as you tell me, as soon as you tell me what's going on, what, what you did. Oh, she was also convinced that I had had abortions. I hope that everyone who's watching this and listening along can recognize this is shame based. This is instilling shame in the victim. And so they feel like it's their fault. The abuser can start saying things like, well, I'm not doing anything wrong because they're still holding things back. So I am just trying to correct them. And it becomes the victim's fault that the abuse is continuing. I hope you all see how twisted that is and how antithetical that is to the values of therapy and counseling, where we are trying to support the client, trying to help them clarify what they are looking for out of life and having a realistic appraisal of themselves and of other people. I went, she made me do 12 step because she was convinced I was an addict, like a drug addict as well. I'd never done drugs. I'd never had sex. Again, I didn't know that masturbation was even possible. I had no idea what these things were. Um, so I would start, I just started making things up as a way as like trying to get this to stop because I had no no one there to, to help me and to save me. And I even, I think I even said that on the podcast that I was making things up. And when I spoke to the, de the detective um, down in um, St. George days ago, I told her that as well. It's like, I, and so even if he had confessed, it, can, it cannot be taken seriously mm. because this child was being tortured. And I'm certain that the, she echoed those words of like, if you tell me, I will stop. Um, so what is happening, it just echoes so close to home of what she did to me. And the repercussions, the emotional and physical repercussions of that, those actions, like the fact that she can, because the, the thing that's so sinister about this is that it can't be disproven. So even if nothing, even if like she goes to prison, you know, he is, his name is cleared, it will never be fully cleared because it cannot be disproven. So this is going to potentially follow him for the rest of his life. So even with those children being taken out of her care, she is still abusing them. And she makes a really good point here. Trauma doesn't stop when you're separated from the abuser. As you can see, Jessie Hildebrandt is still suffering from the less than one year that she spent in her aunt's care. And this really blows my mind. And I just wonder what could Jody Hildebrandt's motive really be in all of this and maybe I'm just thinking too much into somebody who just has something not wired quite right up here but if she was monitoring her niece this closely to the point where she had no privacy no doors how can she be convinced that she's doing drugs having sex having abortions being addicted to masturbation like how I mean there's a disconnect between the reality of things and what she imagined her niece was doing and that just, I just don't understand that. I mean, whatever did happen, I can guarantee you it's not what she's saying. Her business connections classroom, is this the same approach she uses for all of her patients as well that are not family or not Ruby's kids, as um, you know? Uh, I, I don't know the intricacies of what she promotes and what she teaches on connections classroom. Um, if it's anything in, even close, then I mean, I'm certain that there's going to be parallels. Um, I'm certain, I know that she believes that um, all shame should be punished. And I, I know that like that, I, so like, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, 
That's a very telling quote. All shame should be punished. And so I've read a book recently that talks about pro-social shame. The purpose of shame in our society is to bring someone back into the fold. When someone is shamed, they feel embarrassed because they did something that was out of step with what the society accepts, what the society has said is appropriate or acceptable. So what the, the shame makes us want to do is change our behavior to conform. And within things like wearing clothes outside, pro-social shame is helpful and appropriate. But when we turn it into just something that is completely negative, must always be punished, and we isolate somebody who feels shame, exile them, that is not the purpose of shame. The purpose of shame is reconciliation and reconnecting with community, not further isolation and being torn away from society. Heal and to try to salvage any life that I could possibly live um, post yeah. living with her. Understand. With that said, it sounds like this wasn't really a secret though. Obviously you knew about these teachings, other people in her family, probably both families I've been hearing, knew about some of these practices or had heard of. Why do you think it took to 2023 for a child to escape, go yeah. to a neighbor's house, call 911, and now this is a thing? Like, why did it take this long? I think that's a big question. Um, I think it's lines. a combination of quite a few things. One, the church supports her. She's mm. been promoted by the church and people trust the church. Members trust their bishops, they trust their stake presidents. And a lot of these people, most people that are going to therapy, if not all, are in a vulnerable position. Mm. And she is remarkably convincing. She is also terrifying if you cross her mm. because she, she has and will systematically destroy your life. She destroys your reputation. She d destroys any of, of your credibility. So even, because there are definitely people that have been speaking out against her. I mean, she, was she lost her license because of someone speaking out in 2012. Like this is not, she's not just, everyone's not just been like, okay, yeah, for sure. Free, fair game, free, free for all. People have been criticizing her. Mm -hmm. That's just that no one has listened. She's making a good point. There's institutional power behind what Jody Hildebrandt was doing. Like she said, she was backed by the church. People coming in to see her were in a very vulnerable place, whether vulnerable to the authority of the church or to her authority as a licensed clinician. But again, that speaks to the ethical responsibility that we as therapists and counselors have to acknowledge that there is a power dynamic and to be able to wield that responsibly and ethically. And that's why there needs to be some kind of recourse for people in those positions who are being abused, where the system will actually be on their side to support them instead of just supporting the establishment person. Well, not believing children and not trusting children. Hmm. And also children trust their parents and then they, and the parents trust the church. So there's been, and, and Jody, what she does that's so tricky is that she utilizes and uses whatever is available. So if you go to her with OCD, if you go to her with severe depression, she'll use that information as a way of control. Hmm. Oh, you have OCD because you have deep rooted shame. And those ticks are happening because the shame has nowhere to go. And so it's coming out in this, like this neuroticism. And, and then, or let's say like, she'll, oh, you can, you told her that you lied, which is a normal human thing that we've all done. That doesn't make you a liar. Oh, well you lied. You're a liar. Now everything you say is a lie and you can't be trusted. And she also separates people. Okay. That's a hugely important point. Okay. When we talk about people and their diagnoses, people do not and should not be defined by their diagnoses, okay? You might have OCD, you might struggle with anxiety, you are not your diagnosis. And when that becomes the all-encompassing feature, like she said in her example of lying, if that's all you become to somebody and that's what you're told you always are, you start to believe it, you start doubting yourself, you start doubting your ability to make change if I'm just a lying person, if I'm just a liar, why should I even bother trying to change? Because that is just the core of my character. And so there's no room for change there. And that's what she's getting at here. She, 
apparently Jody Hildebrand could just encircle you and ensnare you with something that's part of yourself or part of your experience that becomes a fence and closes you in, that closes you in for your whole existence. She keeps people so they don't can't talk and corroborate. Like it's, it is so vile and tricky and ingenious. Like Jody is, <laughs> she is a, she is a, she is a very unwell person. I don't, I, I don't know her ex exact diagnoses, but I know that she's been diagnosed with a plethora of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so it, it's, 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 it's devastating because I went forward as well. I mean, I went to the police when I was 16. I went, I, I tried to do what I could and no one believed me mm -hmm. because why would they? She destroyed my credibility. I was an angry teenager and now I'm just so, oh, you're just like an emotional, angry teenager that, and she had told people that I destroyed my family's life, that I destroyed my dad's life, that every person I come in contact, I destroy. So she sets up the premise. And then when I come forward and try to tell people like, this is what's happening, she can be like, oh, see, Jesse's trying to destroy my life is what they do. Hmm. It just all adds up. So she's so good at protecting those loopholes and discrediting people. Is that why you think maybe other mem members? Man, that is such, yeah, I think she summed it up. That's tricky, that's vile, and completely the opposite of what we're trying to do as therapists. We're trying to empower our clients to be able to assert themselves, to be able to recognize what they are looking for, what goals they have, and to move towards those. And all of this is against any of the principles that we learn about or aspire to within the helping professions. Both families still won't speak out publicly about this right now and are, are staying quiet? Or do you think it's a fear thing or just want to stay out of it? Is there any thought process yeah. on that? I can't speak to why people aren't. Um, I know the culture of my family. Um, I think that it's probably a, 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 probably a number of things. Some people, I think it's just that they've, they themselves have been harmed so much by her and they want to stay. They just want to live their life and, and not be dragged into this. Um, other members, it could be fear. I, I really, I can't say all I can say. And, and again, the only reason why I'm coming forward, I, I was not planning on coming forward to the media other than just doing the podcast interview, um, is when I heard that Ruby accused her child of this because it's, and I just hope that this can give the public some context and some clarity of what is happening and why they should not believe her. And I really appreciate that as Jesse Hildebrandt is speaking out, the amount of courage that it takes when she's saying that all these other families, when combined, they might have a lot of influence to be able to shape that narrative, are afraid of the backlash or just wanting to be done with the whole thing, which I could totally understand. But she is putting herself out there, airing her dirty laundry, confronting trauma that it really seems like she's tried to work through in the past in order to speak out and to be able to help these kids that are now suffering and are being mistreated and maligned by their own mother because that is her floundering way of asserting control over the narrative. I really appreciate the work that she's done to speak out and be courageous in that. And I hope we can honor that. So six charges of aggravated child abuse. That's what's on the table. I, I'm sure you're not a legal expert. I'm not either. But I've talked to a number of attorneys just kind of about this case, more about the hype of the case, because it's obviously gotten a ton of attention because yeah. of his profile, right? Because of the high profile aspect of the of the YouTube channel. And, and that's why I think it's interesting we're talking about Jody, because Ruby's got, as you mentioned, is getting the spotlight in a weird way. And Jody, yeah. as you mentioned, is, is booked behind a lot of the tactics. Do you feel right. like six felony charges, I mean, in your mind, is that enough punish punishment for what is alleged against them? I mean, I don't think that it's the full scope. Um, no, clearly. I mean, including my own child abuse that mm -hmm. I experienced. Um, I, I mean, I want justice and I want fair justice. So I want everything that she has done that both of them have done to be held accountable. Um, whether that be six, 12, 18, however many, um, I just wanna see that she is held accountable for the things that she has done. Mm 
-hmm. because but I, I I personally believe that that is not gonna that is not covering everything that she's done and I can say that because I know that she's not being held accountable for what she did to me and that is that blows my mind too that after a family spoke up and Jody Hildebrandt lost her license which which happened in the last decade she was able to have her license reinstated apparently and go back to doing the same thing and there was no further follow-up on that that speaks to a lack of oversight that speaks to a, an abuse of authority and and just the institutional power that she held as a person within that profession licensed by that board to be able to be punished once go back and keep doing the same thing until finally something else blows up. How closely are you following this? Are you looking every day to see if there's something new that's put out? I mean, where is your mindset at with the case, so to speak? Yeah, um, I'm not following it every single day. I, I'm trying to navigate just my own emotional safety in all of this. I'm trying to stay up to date. I have people that have sent me things that like, are feel that feel a little bit more safe in being more aware of what's going on and so like when something big does come out like what ruby like with ruby's accusations they i had someone someone sent that to me hmm. um and i <laughs> i was sitting in the parking lot of lowe's and i started having a panic attack because it was just so directly similar hmm. i mean the exact thing this is exactly what she does this is what jody does and so now, because she's painted him as this thing, regardless of what comes out, like he's no longer, I mean, I think hopefully the public can see through this and the judge can see through this, but that's the, that's the goal is so that anything that he says is now no longer credible. I want to just touch on what you said really quick about having a panic attack when she heard the news. That's not uncommon. When we're talking about PTSD, that trauma, even though you work through it, even though you try to heal and try to move on and live your life, that can show up in unexpected ways. And when this particularly triggering message that, oh, you know, you're a sexual predator or abuser yourself, that accusation obviously made a deep impact on Jesse. And so when she heard that was directed to someone else, her fight or flight system started to activate and she felt like she was in danger all over again, going back to that same position that she was when she was 16, 17, and having her name dragged like this, having her reputation destroyed by someone who was supposed to be caring for her. The public will ultimately take away from these two as it pertains to the court proceedings and such. I mean, I just, I just hope that Jody is not sidelined in this because she is so, so connected to what is happening. And yes, Ruby needs to be held accountable because she is she made those choices. She's just mm -hmm. as, as, as guilty. Um, but Jody has been doing this for much longer mm. and has, has uh, patterns and history in this. So I just really, really hope that yes, Ruby is the focus because of her high profile and because they're her children. But those children were, as far as I'm aware, I hope I got this right. We're in Jody's care. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't, I, I just I'm just so I just so hope that even though Ruby's the focus, I just hope that Jody is not um, that she's not able to slink away and just kind of fade into the background because she is she is the foundation. Wow, what a powerful story! Again, I I think it bears saying that I really want to honor the courage that Jesse Hildebrand showed and being able to confront her own past, her trauma, the fears that she might have around her aunt and the experience that she had with her to be able to speak out in support of the kids in this family that are really suffering and struggling right now. I think my takeaway is that parents, when you seek out a therapist or a counselor, it's good to know that they're licensed. It's good to know that they have a good education from an, from an accredited school that they've done all their continuing education have maintained their license that does not mean necessarily that they are good people and that really hurts me to say because i know the work that i put in to get to this point 
where I can practice independently. I don't need a supervisor who is checking up on all of my notes. And that is a trust that's been given to me by virtue of the work I've put in. And it hurts me to say that some people abuse that trust. Some people abuse the authority that they've been given. And so just as a, a protective factor for families who are seeking help, whether individually or for families or for marriages, you should be able to ask your provider at any point, why are we talking about this? What is your reasoning or theoretical model that is informing the treatment that you're providing? Where is the research that backs up what you are doing? If they can't answer that in a way that's satisfactory to you, you can fire them. I, I made another video uh, a couple months ago about reasons you should break up with your therapist. This would be a reason to. Even though they have earned that institutional trust in terms of having their license, they need to be earning your trust every time you step into that therapy room. And that is not something that should be taken for granted. We are dealing with things as we see in this case children's lives and well-being that is more important than making things awkward or putting someone in an uncomfortable spot it's too important we're way beyond that point and so i hope this is a wake-up call for therapists and counselors a wake-up call for parents who are seeking therapy for themselves or for their kids or for their families for there to be a restored sense of trust in the helping professions a dramatic story like this has an opportunity to break that trust that the public has in our profession that we've worked hard to establish and therapists need to be aware of that as we move forward everyone thank you so much for checking out this video this was really hard to watch and i was willing to do it because this so directly impacts the field that i'm working in and so many people who have followed the story, who have experienced abuse at the hands of their parents, uh, at the hands of the church, or at the hands of mental health professionals. This was worth the discomfort to wade through that, wade through the ugliness and the distortions that Jody Hildebrand apparently preaches and charges people to learn from her. And I'm interested in hearing what you all think after hearing some of that. So please like and subscribe. That helps us to create more content for you all and to continue advocating for better mental health treatment for everybody. Thank you so much for checking out this video. See you next time.